There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it. No matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. And we've got a special for you listeners today. If you want to add a little zing back to the bedroom, make sure you stay tuned. We're going to help you get those happy Z's that you so richly deserve. That's a little later on. But tonight it's Supernatural News and joining me at the Supernatural News Desk, Mr. Tim Dennis. Good evening, Tim. Good evening. We've got an interesting couple of days here. I want to uh, make a quick mention. Tonight's show will begin with brand new supernatural news and a tribute to two of our fallen comrades in the paranormal field as we were hit pretty rough over the last couple of days with news regarding the passing of two paranormal legends. And the remainder of today's show will be a special throwback episode paying honor to one of those comrades, Mr. Guy Lyon Playfair, who was one of the uh, most integral investigators in the original Enfield poltergeist case. As a matter of fact, he's the author of the definitive book, This House is Haunted, which was an examination of the Enfield poltergeist case. He was one of the guys boots on the ground there doing the investigation, and we just lost him last week. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, we're going to play today the first part of that interview, An Anatomy of a Poltergeist. And then on Wednesday, we'll continue, as it was an original three-hour interview, We'll continue on Wednesday with the last two hours of the interview on the Enfield Poltergeist case, which also includes a startling admission regarding the Warrens' actual involvement in that investigation. So stay tuned. That's what we're going to be doing the next two days. Back Friday again with another brand new episode and another theater of the mind. Tim, this was uh, this was a heavy, heavy Friday the 13th, a punch and a blow that kind of hit the entire paranormal field and radio in general. I was uh, awoken by my wife to the news uh, that Art Bell, the creator of Coast to Coast AM, had passed away on Friday the 13th. Yeah, to say it was uh, unexpected, I think, is to is to uh, understate it quite a bit. You know, it started with uh, Heather Wade, who, who took over uh, for Art uh, for uh, Midnight in the Desert. Uh, saying that she was not going to do the show that night. Uh, she denounced that on Facebook. And a lot of people were speculating, well, you know, you need to take time for you. And, and she was rather cryptic about it, but saying that she had something she had to deal with. And it was just a matter of time where people had put it on that timeline, on that thread, that Art had passed away. And, you know, people were speculating, but... It, nothing had become official, but then it, it went from there. Uh, we are saddened to, to announce that uh, the creator and original host of Coast to Coast AM, Art Bell, passed away at the age of 72 at his home in Pahrump, Nevada. And uh, I do want to mention, too, that we're, we're getting uh, the lion's share, well, the, 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 the brunt of this entire information directly from Coast to Coast AM so that we could... Uh, deliver this information to you directly and all of the actual uh, information that was vetted out. So, um, yeah, the, I, I, you know, the news was also released from the actual police department. The sheriff's office made a public announcement, which I guess I found out now was without the permission of uh, Art's wife. So, um, yeah, it, kind of disheartening. There was a there was a statement by uh, ArtBell.com on Facebook, or the ArtBell.com Facebook page that said that it had been released prematurely by the uh, by the sheriff's the county sheriff's department. 
um, in that video of a lot of people have. And in fact, I even posted the video on my page thinking that, right. of course, it was sanctioned by the family. Um, and uh, evidently not. It had not been sanctioned by the family to be released. Uh, they kind of it looked like it was a. Uh, like a pre-produced package, much like a news department would do. And, of course, Art being the most famous person in the county, they probably had something pre-produced for quite some time, uh, as Art had had an issue with COPD uh, earlier last fall and had been in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, So they they probably had had something pre-packaged in case something had happened with him. Uh, While serving in the U.S. Air Force in the Vietnam War, he indulged his childhood passion for radio by operating a pirate station that played anti-war music, otherwise unable on official channels broadcast to American servicemen. Following his time in the service, his love of radio led him to working as a disc jockey for an English language station in Japan, where he set a Guinness World Record for broadcasting an astounding 116 hours straight, which I'll tell you will uh, will hurt the back and the buttocks quite a bit if you try that. I did it. I think I did 22 hours when I attended Winona State University, and that was, to me, insane that but uh, uh, but this I is did, yeah I did 22 hours but 100 i can't even imagine that that's just un, unheard of uh this was no mere radio stunt however as it served to raise funds to rescue over 100 vietnamese orphans left stranded by the conflict in their home country upon returning to the united states he entered the world of talk radio with an overnight program on kdwn in las vegas After noticing that episodes covering conspiracy theories and paranormal topics generated considerable interest from listeners, Bell transformed the show from political talk to discussion of these often verboten realms. Syndicated nationally in 1993, Coast to Coast AM soon became a juggernaut and bona fide radio phenomenon. Uh, During the 1990s, when the X-Files had people wondering about the world of high strangeness, Art Bell was the voice of that world, introducing millions of radio listeners to a vast array of paranormal topics and the researchers that studied them. Over the course of countless programs throughout the decade and into the 2000s, Art Bell captured listeners by way of his intellectually curious and open-minded conversations with guests who are attempting to find answers to the paranormal mysteries which baffle us all. Although he retired from full-time hosting at the end of 2002, Art returned to occasionally helm coast-to-coast AM programs on weekends and later launched his own satellite radio program, Art Bell's Dark Matter, as well as an internet-based endeavor called Midnight in the Desert, which was later taken over by Heather Wade. As founder of Coast to Coast AM, his role in crafting and shaping this program can be felt to this day in elements like the iconic phone lines emanating from east of the Rockies, west of the Rockies, and the always unpredictable wildcard line, as well as the annual Ghost to Ghost AM Halloween specials, and of course, Coast to Coast signature opening theme song. We, of course, extend our deepest condolences to Art Bell's family and friends, and we celebrate him for his brilliant creation of Coast to Coast AM and the many unforgettable moments he shared with us over the years. And as he begins his journey to the other side, we take solace in the hope that he is now finding out all the answers to the mysteries he pursued for so many nights with all of us. You know, when you reached out to me, I think it was in November of 2005 and said, Dave, I've got an hour to fill on our station. Do you want to get together and do radio together? And I said, yeah, uh, let's do a paranormal show and we'll kind of be the Minnesota accoutrement to coast to coast AM as they were on 1500 AM 1500 here in the Twin Cities. We were on AM 1440. I just thought it'd be great if we could lend that part of ourselves to it and do a paranormal show. And I remember you saying paranormal, why paranormal? And, and I, you know, we talked about that and I said, listen, we've, you know, we both have an interest. We both had experiences. It's something interesting. And aside from coast to coast and, and, you know, like the paranormal podcast with Jim Harold, there was really nothing else out there. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, gave the nod and said, yeah, let's, let's make this happen. And, you know, our show was always meant to be kind of a, a, an accompanying piece to Coast to Coast. And we were lucky enough to see that come to fruition when we worked with uh, Twin Cities News Talk, uh, FM 100.3 and AM 1130 in Minneapolis, St. Paul, when um, the uh, station that carried Coast to Coast for many years uh, decided to flip to an all sports format. 
Tim and I said, hey, uh, you, we went to our, our program director and said, you guys need to pick up Coast to Coast. It's it's part of the family. And they – it was a double-edged sword, if you remember, Tim. They came back to us after us having been settled in on Saturdays and Sundays from 9 to midnight and said, well, we took your advice. We picked up Coast to Coast. The bad news is we no longer need you <laughs> on Saturday and Sunday nights. And instead, they, they allowed us to start broadcasting from 11 to midnight Monday through Friday – and we became the opening act in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis-St. Paul for Coast to Coast AM. And that opened up a lot of doors for us. And uh, it, it made it a part of our world. I love and loved Coast to Coast listening to it. I, you know, I've mentioned it on other shows. But boy, Tim, can you think of anything better? I mean, that was true appointment radio and a chance to hear the stuff that we were all so intrigued with that nobody else would talk about. It was always swept under the carpet or done very tongue-in-cheek. And Art, from his little desolate bunker somewhere in in Nevada, would broadcast these stories of fantasy and whimsy and sci-fi coming to life. And it just, I mean, it captured the world. I think he had over 500 stations at one point uh, at his peak and, and millions and millions of listeners around the world that hung on his every well-placed word and he is going to definitely be missed it's safe to say what the show was never as popular as it was when it was in art's hands um when you say the 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 title of coast to coast am people are synonymous with art bell it's the art bell show i think i think people the the common layman out there says it's the art bell show you know it's 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 hand in hand with art and of course art having having founded that show is is the man when it comes to paranormal radio and uh he is that genre he is this genre to say that that uh anybody else would even be associated with it or even come close to being associated with it is, is almost laughable um it's it's one of those things where before art came along like you were mentioning when mainstream media would bring it up they'd almost kind of scoff at it and when art brought it up it became a legitimate form of radio it became a legitimate form of talk radio and not only that, but Art had a way of also bringing humor into it. When it was, uh, you know, when he would bring up the the um, the devil's hotline, or, or if you think you're Satan, call you know, right. call call or, this. Are number. you a time traveler? Call right. now, yep. and, and they would give a, a hotline number that you could call in if you were supposedly Satan or demonically possessed or yeah. a time traveler. Uh, yeah. Art had a it's, way of throwing yeah. that sense of humor into it at the same time that, that he was talking about it. And he also, people people don't realize this either. If you listen to Somewhere in Time, which Premier Radio Network still puts out on the weekends, people say, well, Art never talked politics. That's not true. He did. He mixed in politics along with the paranormal. And he had a way of doing it where politics tied into conspiracy theory, tied into the paranormal. And he had a masterful way of throwing all three in there and making these topics just sing. And you were riveted for those four hours of radio overnight to the point where you didn't want to go to sleep. And he was right. just, he was a master storyteller. I think he was, in this era, in the last 100 years, one of the greatest storytellers ever to hit the air. I agree. 1991, I think it was, Tim. I was living in North Minneapolis off of Irving Avenue. And I was driving home from a night after, I think it was, we had gone out playing softball or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm driving home after a night of drinking, and I'm introduced to Coast to Coast that night with their special guest, Dr. Barry Taff, who's going to talk to us tonight about the entity case and the San Pedro haunting. And I sat in my car for four hours, riveted, because I didn't have a radio inside my house, and I couldn't leave. I couldn't walk away from that interview it was astounding and and the way art's voice and pause and and just the way he played the story uh, it was remarkable I, I i remember that to this day four hours and then then hearing john teeter the time traveler time traveler zero right right the original john teeter story unfold or the panicky calls from area 51 you listen to these shows and my god it is true theater of the mind it's it's everything that we've ever wanted to emulate 
and you know of course do a pale comparison to that was it and yeah i will be i want to be honest up front because listeners of the show know that i was a little hard on art after his midnight in the desert debacle Mm -hmm. and i stand by that but when art was at his peak he was the best that ever was in radio there was some weird stuff going on in his world when he came back with dark matter and went to XM Sirius, then left F- XM Sirius and started an online community and was going to do an online show and then came back years later with Midnight in the Desert after his contract expired with XM Sirius. And I don't, what did that last, two months? He wasn't, yeah, about that two or three months. He wasn't at it very long. No, and, and there were these strange uh, stories of, of somebody stalking him and his family. Shots were fired, but there was no reports from the local news, no reports from the local police department regarding this on dockets or stories anywhere. So there was a lot of conjecture and a lot of conspiracy. And, I, you know, I was harsh about it. I thought, good God, man, if you don't want to be in radio, just walk away from radio or come back to coast to coast and be a weekend host from time to time. That would have been a better outlet for this. And, uh, you know, it broke my heart along with many other listeners that wanted to hear the re- return of the king to late night radio and bring back that that aspect. Not that G- George Norrie's done anything wrong with Coast to Coast. Right. They were right. complementary towards one another, two mm-hmm. totally different uh, ways of approaching the same topics. And, I, you know, we're, we're friends with George. You and I love and respect George. And he gave us the hand up to uh, allow us to step in and, and be fill-in hosts on Coast to Coast AM for five years now. Can you believe it? We've been a part of it for five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we owe a lot to George Nori and, and Lisa Lyon and the people involved at Coast to Coast AM. But, you know, without Art Bell... Without Coast to Coast AM, there would have never been an opportunity for Darkness Radio because I don't think the general manager of your radio station at that time would have gone for it unless he kind of understood that format because of what Art had already done very successfully for, you know, 15 years, 20 years before that. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, the, there always has to be one that's a trailblazer that has this outside the box thinking that sits down and says this is what i envision give me a shot let me put it forward and really art not only had the idea for the format but then also had the the forward thinking to syndicate it you know i, I mean not just you know sit down and say i'm going to do this in local Pahrump, nevada or and, and he owned his own station as well uh talk about forward thinking but right. but then to to try and put it together nationally before he even sold to to uh what was now what is now premier radio networks um he had 500 and some stations before he even right. sold uh, sold out to syndication so he wasn't himself a juggernaut at that point yeah um i mean you know the the, the man put together quite the uh quite the uh deal before he even uh sold before out before anybody else was doing that right yeah, and yeah. i do want to make a, a quick footnote Art Bell was not the first paranormal radio host. That's true. He was not the first. But that talks to the power of what Art Bell was. He is the most famous and the most well-known and the most accepted because of just how good he was. I mean, like there were talk show hosts before Johnny Carson, and there have been talk show hosts since Johnny Carson, but there will never be another Johnny Carson and in the world of radio, there will never be another Art Bell, and he will be missed. Absolutely. All right, sir, where are we going next in the world of supernatural news? Well, I'm going to blame this pronunciation right away on you, because you've never taken me to Romania. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It just feels weird. You know, you, you like to cuddle way too much, Tim. Well, I need to be held, Dave. That's, that's well, what I'm saying. That's understandable. Uh, the Bermuda Triangle of Romania, Dave, inside the haunted forest that terrifies tourists. You give me the pronunciation, Dave. I've never been there. It's, what is it? I, I believe it's the Hoya Baisu Haunted Forest. Hoya, Hoya Baisu. Baisu Forest. There, I don't look like an idiot. And I can't read Romanian in in an email. So I, I save myself <laughs> two embarrassments there. The Hoya Baisu Forest is one of Romania's spookiest tourist attractions, but you'll have to be brave to visit. That's according to the article here. Hoya Baisu has become known as the Bermuda Triangle of Transylvania because of its paranormal reputation. Over the years, reports have linked the region with UFOs, ghosts, and missing people. Uh, 
and it asks, would you dare visit? Well, Dave's going to. I mean, you, you might as well follow him, right? I'm, I'm excited. This is our third visit to Romania, and we've never made it to the uh, Hoya Baisu Forest. So this year, in September, I'm going with listeners. There's about 25 of us currently. We're open up to about 30, 32 people that will allow on this trip. So there are still a few slots open. But um, we are starting the trip in the forest, and we will get to do a, a nighttime walkthrough, Tim, Ooh. in the Bermuda Triangle of Romania and, and Transylvania. I mean, this is really cool for paranormal enthusiasts. There have been ghosts, UFOs, cryptid creatures, visions of the Strigoi, which are the original vampires and zombie kind of creatures. Mm -hmm. So I'm super psyched to get the opportunity. And I, you know, not meaning to turn this into a, a an infomercial, but if you want to join me, go check out darknessevents.com. That's darknessevents.com and click on the uh, Romania trip uh, banner and, and sign up now. This is the ultimate trip of a lifetime to start in the haunted forest, get to see all the castles associated. I should say four of the castles associated with the original Dracula, Vlad the Impaler, and follow through the footsteps in haunted castles, crypts, cemeteries, and more. It's going to be an astounding trip, and it will be our final trip to Romania for these foreign events. Now, I'm going to butcher this name. A couple of them just slaughter it like Vlad the Impaler. Uh, the notorious forest is located in, I believe it's Cluj County. West, you are right. Is it? Well, west mm -hmm. of the city of Cluj. Is it Napocha? Napoca? Sure. Nap Who cares? Sure. Yeah, Cluj, Napoca. Let's say that. All right. Uh, you Napoca it. You brought it. Uh, it spans around 700 acres in size and is believed to be where hundreds of Romanians have gone missing. Ooh, ooh not good. Uh, Hoya Baisu was first seen as an area of interest when a shepherd went missing there. Although the sheep still remained, if you know what I mean. I don't know. Uh, the centuries-old legend states that the man disappeared without a trace along with his 200 sheep. Well, oh, that's not good. Uh, the folklore was given another layer of intrigue when a military technician claimed to have photographed a UFO there. In 1968, uh, Emil Barnea uh, insisted that he spotted an extraterrestrial body in the sky. Uh, while this sighting has never been proven, other tourists have s reported similar occurrences. Some also recall an unnerving feeling that they were being watched by a paranormal presence. Despite these reports, the location's spooky reputation isn't enough to put tourists off. Some choose to walk around the infamous forest by themselves, while others feel more assured uh, in a guide's company, <laughs> which I think maybe you should probably pick the guide. Uh, there are a variety of different tours that take place at Hoya Baisu, uh, with some focusing on the ghostly legends associated with the region. Some visitors have taken to TripAdvisor to reveal all about the spine-tingling experience. One wrote, The forest at night is mysterious and eerie and definitely gets the adrenaline pumping. Another added, We came to the forest just before nightfall. There were no gimmicks, no fake stories, nothing made up just to scare us, just the enjoyment of nature and the wonderful stories. This experience is definitely what you make it. If you choose to be engaged with nature, you will love it. And if you choose to be afraid of the dark, you will be scared. If you choose to meet an entity, you just might get that chance too. So would you dare to step foot in the creepy forest? It's not the only unusual location that tourists are drawn to. It says here in this article, previously, uh, travelers were baffled by Antarctica's Blood Falls. Well, that sounds nice and romantic. Uh, and the uh, mysterious Eye of Sahara is another region that has sparked debate among holidaymakers as well. Very cool. I cannot wait to get back out there. This uh, li Literally, if I could retire anywhere and still see my, my kids on a regular basis, I would retire and move to... Romania in a heartbeat. It is beautiful. The people are amazing. The history, the the architecture. Honestly, I love this country. I mm. love this country, Tim. But uh, that's where I'm looking forward to going. So again, if you want to join me, check it out, darknessevents.com for our final foreign adventure to Romania to follow in the footsteps of Dracula. And we start off in the haunted Hyobot. Hi God, now I can't even say it. The Baisu Forest. We're going to be there first. So check it out at darknessevents.com. Where are we going next, sir? Well, Buzz Aldrin's taking it all back. That's it. He, 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 he gives up, what? Dave. He never saw a UFO. That's it. Really? Yep. He disputes. Well, I think that's always been up for 
debate anyway. Did he ever really say that? What, what's being said now? Well, he disputes claims that a lie detector test proved that he encountered alien life. Astronaut Buzz Aldrin says he never saw a UFO and recent claims that he passed a lie detector test proving he encountered alien life are fabricated. Reports earlier this week suggested that interviews by Aldrin, the second man on the moon, and four other astronauts in which they mentioned seeing unidentified objects were examined under strict lab conditions and proved they were all telling the truth. And he says not so much. Uh, but when Sun Online reached out to Aldrin, his spokeswoman revealed the claims were a fabrication. She said, we don't know where this story came from. Buzz did not take a lie detector test. He has never saw a, or he has never said he saw a UFO. That was her, her quote. Uh, this story has been a fabrication for the sake of headlines and is not true as far as Buzz Aldrin is concerned. As previously reported, the original story reports that Aldrin, along with Al Worden, Edgar Mitchell, and Gordon Cooper, all took part in the study in which their accounts of space travel analyzed by the Institute of Bioacoustic Biology in Albany, Ohio. Uh, experts claimed a TV interview he gave in which he said there was something out there that was close enough to be observed, sort of L-shaped. The test reportedly more reliable than standard lie detector tests shows he was telling the truth, the Daily Star reported. However, it turns out that the 88-year-old Aldrin was telling the truth about seeing something in the skies as he traveled to the moon. But as he later clarified in a Q&A with fans, it was probably light reflecting off of one of the panels that had come off the rocket and not alien life. Uh, Aldrin said on Reddit, on Apollo 11, en route to the moon, I observed a light out the window that appeared to be moving alongside us. There were many explanations of what that could be, other than spacecraft from another country or another world. It was either the rocket that we had separated from, or the four panels that moved away when we extracted the lander from the rocket, and we were nose-to-nose with the two spacecraft. So in the close vicinity, moving away, we were, were four panels. And I feel absolutely convinced that we were looking at the sun reflected off one of these panels. Which one? I don't know. So technically, the definition could be unidentified. Uh Uh-huh. That's your unidentified flying object is a panel. (laughs) Plausible deniability. Uh Uh-huh. He added, when we returned, we debriefed and explained exactly what we had observed. And I felt that this had been distributed to the outside world, the outside audience, and apparently it wasn't. And so many years later, I had the time in an interview to disclose these observations and another country's television network. And the UFO people in the United States were very, very angry with me that I had not given them the information. It was not an alien. He added, there may be aliens in our Milky Way galaxy, and there are billions of other galaxies. The probability is almost certain that there is life somewhere in space. It was not that remarkable, that special, that unusual, that life here on Earth evolved gradually, slowly to where we are today. That was his quote. Apollo 15 pilot Warden, who is 85, and Apollo 14's Mitchell also claimed to have seen UFOs, while Cooper says he actually tried to chase a cluster of objects. Tests analyzing their voice patterns suggested that they were also telling the truth about their strange encounters. Yet UFO expert Nick Pope also disputed the study, saying he believed it was misleading and used pseudoscience. He told Sun Online the suggestion that Buzz passed a lie detector test about this as part of a wider study is misleading, to say the least. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, What seems to have happened is that a decidedly New Age-sounding institute looked at some old astronaut interviews, probably just pulled off YouTube and ran them through a CVSA, or Computer Voice Stress Analysis, program. CVSA and voice stress analysis is more generally widely regarded as being pseudoscience. It's misleading for anyone to suggest the astronauts participated in a study. Indeed, some of the interviews analyzed are from astronauts who died. I hope nobody is trying to use the good name and reputation of heroes like Buzz Aldrin to promote their own beliefs. Sun Online has reached out to the Institute of Bioacoustic Biology for comment. On July 21st, 1969, Neil Armstrong made history by becoming the first person to set foot on the Earth's moon. Uh, Upon landing, he is famously quoted as saying, That's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. Buzz was on the same mission, Apollo 11, as Neil Armstrong, and soon followed in his footsteps, making him the second man on the moon. 
All right, Tim, I know we have just two more stories before we begin our tribute for our friend Guy Lyon Playfair. Where will we go next, sir? Well, we are going to the Enfield Poltergeist case, Dave. And in fact, the quote is, I never believed in the Enfield Poltergeist until I heard strange scraping on the floorboards and recorded the ghost's demonic voice. Roz Morris was one of the first reporters to look into the case of the Enfield Poltergeist. And 40 years later, she's still baffled by it. Uh, the mom of four, Peggy Hodgson, had just put her daughter Janet to bed when she heard loud scraping noises coming from the room that the 11-year-old shared with 10-year-old Johnny. The single mom ran upstairs to see what the kids were up to, but was stunned when she opened the door to see a heavy wooden dresser sliding unaided across the room with the children watching aghast from their beds. Peggy rushed the chest back into place, but it moved again as soon as she let go, and the sounds of someone or something knocking frantically against the walls reverberated around the council house. Terrified and confused, she gathered Johnny, Janet, and her other kids, 14-year-old Margaret and 7-year-old Billy, and fetched her neighbor for a second opinion. Later that night, on August 31, 1977, the police were called to 284 Green Street in the London borough of Enfield, uh, where the first officer on the scene was reported that she, too, had seen furniture dancing around the room as if carried by a ghost. It was a proper paranormal mystery, and the next day the story was in the papers, and the legend of the Enfeld poltergeist was born. Between the years of 1977 and 1979, the house remained the scene of strange goings-on, centered around sisters Janet and Margaret. Eerie banging sounds could be heard throughout the house, chairs tipped over without warning, and a deep demonic voice started coming from Janet without any sign of the girl opening her mouth. Just before I died, I went blind. The gravelly, threatening voice started out in one particularly... A distressing outburst from Janet's direction, although her lips never moved. And then I had a hemorrhage, and I fell asleep, and I died in the chair in the corner downstairs, that voice went on to say. Reporters went on to capture the voice on tape, recording it telling interviewers to shut up and singing nursery rhymes as well as alluding to a past life in the house. Roz Morris, then a reporter for BBC Radio, was among those the many investigators dispatched to look into the reports of otherworldly horrors, and she would never forget what she uncovered. The journalist entered the house a skeptic, like many people who suspected that the story had been exaggerated or that the weirdness was the result of children playing an elaborate prank on their mother. But Roz left insistent that the case of the Enfield poltergeist was more than a con or childish tricks, and she returned to the, record the husky voice, which followed Janet around for a BBC documentary on the haunting. Now reflecting on the story 40 years later, reporter Roz told Sun Online, I recorded the voices and a thumping, knocking noise on the walls. Uh, there was this very strange voice coming from near Janet. She wasn't moving her lips, but the voice would just appear talking for hours. The voice would say a lot of childish stuff, swearing as well. It was very disturbing. Something strange was happening, which just wasn't normal. Uh, things got weirder when Janet started having violent trances and claims soon spread that the 11-year-old could levitate, supposedly hoisted into the air by a mischievous energy. A famous photo of Janet hovering in the middle of her bedroom was soon published as evidence, taken remotely by a camera set up in Janet's room by Graham Morris. Uh, the spooked photographer said he knew something was up when he first opened the door to 284 Green Street uh, or to a barrage of marbles and Lego bricks, which he says were hurled by the same spirit which tormented Janet. And now he had what many believed was photo evidence, which was stacked in a file bulging with over 2,000 separate reports of paranormal activity at the Enfield home, supplied by over 30 eyewitnesses to the usual goings-on. The story of the Enfield poltergeist has stru or stuck with Roz ever since, and she appeared this week on a BBC Radio 4 show, The Reunion, to look back on the case. Photographer Graham appears on the show as well, having also experienced the strangeness of the whole saga firsthand. He says, I stood in the gloom of the kitchen and one by one brought the children into the adults' arms and the last one to come in was Janet. Suddenly things just took off and started flying around the room. Everyone wanted to see it. They came in as skeptics and left believing that they had seen something. In the following months, 
things got even more sinister as Janet started claiming that she was being used by the poltergeist while the strange bangs and knocking sounds persisted. And then came the interview. Maurice Gross, a former inventor and leading paranormal investigator, had based himself at the house and was joined in the investigation by poltergeist expert Guy Playfair, who sadly passed away uh, this past weekend. Uh, while they were at the home, the researchers reported a curious or a series of curious whistling and barking noises coming from Janet's general direction and were attributed to the mysterious spirit. And so it was decided that the TV camera should be fired up for a world first, a recorded interview with the poltergeist, where Gross tried to pin down who could be behind the hauntings, which were gripping the nation. The investigator did his research and tried to narrow down details about the ghost based on its responses to his questioning. He eventually deduced that the spirit must belong to 72-year-old Bill Wilkins, a man who had lived and died at the house decades earlier. Meanwhile, for Janet, being used as a conduit for a long-dead man seemed to be taking its toll. Her trances became more violent, and her mother allegedly once had to intervene when, during one disturbing episode, Janet wrapped herself in a curtain, the fabric tangled around her throat. The independent reports of strange goings-on blew the story into a national sensation, and the Enfeld poltergeist has since been dramatized on TV series such as The Enfeld Haunting and films like The Conjuring 2. But many skeptics have insisted right from the beginning that, like the exaggerated Hollywood retellings of the story, the case of The Enfeld Poltergeist is nothing more than fiction. At the time, a theory emerged that Mom Peggy was behind the whole thing as part of a ploy to get a better council house or in return for fame and money. But she uh, never made a penny from recounting the story to reporters, and she never moved out of the house right up until her death in 2003. The idea was also floated by skeptics that Janet might be a ventriloquist and could have been behind the demonic voices heard by reporters. Others suggested that the most famous photo of Janet hovering above the ground in her bedroom showed nothing more sinister than a girl bouncing on her bed, triggering the motion camera which had been set up in her room. The skeptics' case was reinforced when the girls admitted to pranking some investigators by hiding their tape players and making odd noises as they poked around the family home. But Janet, now in her 50s, maintains that every other detail of the haunting, from the demonic voice to her sporadic levitation, was totally genuine. And today the house where the hauntings took place is owned by another family, although it remains the site of intense speculation about what really happened 40 years ago. Roz, now the managing director of TV News London, a media training company, says, I was also skeptical at first and looking out for trickery, but there were lots of independent witnesses and it was the report of the policewoman which really stood the story up. I was a reporter for many years and it was the weirdest story I've ever reported on. There was definitely something unusual going on, but I honestly don't know what caused it. There you go. All right. Fascinating stuff, which leads us, unfortunately, into our final news story for the evening. And as it was mentioned in the in the story, uh, Guy Lyon Playfair did pass away uh, this past weekend. Um, it is uh, with great regret and sorrow that uh, we do report that uh, it was actually April 8th that uh, Guy Lyon Playfair passed away at the age of 83. He was born in Keta, India, the son of Major General Ian Playfair and novelist Jocelyn Playfair and was educated in England, studied modern languages at Cambridge, and after national service as a translator with the RAF in Iraq, uh, pursued a career in journalism and working for Life magazine. In the early 1960s, he moved to Rio de Janeiro, uh, where he worked for the next 10 years as a freelance journalist for a number of international business magazines, including The Economist, Time, The Guardian, and The Associated Press. He also served for four years with the Press Corps, of the U.S. Agency for International uh, Development. It was during that time in Brazil in the late 60s that he became interested in the paranormal following direct experience with a psychic healer. Initially, he was skeptical, and he was satisfied from firsthand observations that psi phenomena existed in the country and began studying the subject in depth. In 1973, he investigated a poltergeist outbreak in a private apartment in Sao Paulo, uh, where he succeeded in capturing unexplained rapping sounds on tape. He joined the British Society for Psychical Research the same year and was also a member of the Ghost Club at that time. On his return to Britain in 1974, he wrote the first of a series of best-selling books on psychic topics. 
He also translated into English a large number of original texts on psychic experiences from Latin America, uh, previously available only in Spanish and Portuguese. In 1977, together with Maurice Gross, he investigated the Enfield poltergeist outbreak in North London. He spent 180 days and nights with the troubled family over a two-year period between September 5th of 1977 and June of 1978, including 25 all-night vigils. Over 140 hours of tape recordings were obtained, resulting in transcripts running to over 500 pages. A substantial number of recordings have still yet to be transcribed, believe it or not. Additionally, there were at least 30 other witnesses to strange incidents. Reinvestigated in 1981 and 82 by a special committee assembled by the Society for Psychical Research, the Enfeld Poltergeist Investigation Committee re-examined the witness and collected evidence, later issuing a 194-page report reaching the conclusion that paranormal incidents had indeed occurred in the house. Many details of the case were included in his best-selling book, This House is Haunted, in 1980, which sold 98,000 copies and was reprinted in 2012. Asked if skeptics were, who uh, criticized the case were at a distance had ever attempted to examine the material upon which it was based, uh, Guy Playfair confirmed that in more than 35 years, none had ever taken the opportunity to do so. He also drew attention to most, uh, much positive evidence from the case, which still has yet to be published. The Enfeld case remains the best documented poltergeist disturbance on record. As well as investigating other cases of poltergeists and hauntings, he also conducted experiments with mediums and investigated claims of psychokinesis and metal bending. He was happy to work with the experienced conjurers and members of the Magic Circle to try and explain effects in normal ways, but found many could not be replicated, leaving them open to a psychic explanation. He was also particularly interested in cases of telepathy between identical twins, publishing the book Telepathy Twin Connection in 1999, and in cases of meaningful coincidences, uh, continuing to be active in psychical research until a few weeks before his final illness, he would have appreciated the coincidence that he died the same morning as the BBC broadcast an edition of the Radio 4 program, The Reunion, which was dedicated to the Enfield case. So Guy Lyon Playfair is dead at the age of 83. So without further ado, in honor of our friend Guy Lyon Playfair, we're going to play his last radio interview with darkness radio in its entirety tonight you'll hear the first segment where we talk about the anatomy of a poltergeist his work in different cases and belief and understanding of what poltergeist is on wednesday we'll be back with the completion of the episode the last two hours of the original interview for you and uh, we delve deep into the Enfield poltergeist case and there is an interesting reveal from guy lion playfair regarding the actual involvement of Ed and Lorraine Warren in the investigation. So that's what's on tap for us this week uh, on the show. We'll be back Friday with another brand new episode and a brand new theater of the mind. The following is an encore presentation of Beyond the Darkness. Good evening and welcome. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show is on the air. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, and that guy over there, that's Tim Dennis. Evening. Tim, I think we can honestly say one of the most successful horror movies of the last decade has got to be The Conjuring. Absolutely. Following the adventures of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And uh, they have now released a little bit more information. The sequel to The Conjuring will be coming out, and it's entitled The Conjuring to the Enfield Poltergeist. There are a lot of people that uh, are intrigued by the history, the story of Ed and Lorraine Warren and their work in the field of the paranormal. I wanted to do a little research because I had, had talked to a few people that um, said that they're a little surprised that this is a case that would be the next movie, since this seems to be a case that Ed Warren was not as deeply involved in, hmm. nor was Lorraine. So I wanted to kind of get the backstory of this. And over here in, in America, people may not be as familiar with the Enfield Poltergeist. I know they just did a movie about it, a uh, television movie or miniseries, if you will, over in England. 
but uh, we have yet to see that play here in the United States. So I, I wanted to reach out to someone who was in the know, would have a good understanding, and that's who we have joining us tonight on Darkness Radio. Guy Lyon Playfair was born in India, educated in England, and graduated from Cambridge University. He immigrated to Brazil and spent 14 years there as a freelance journalist with a four-year stint with the U.S. Agency for International Development. And while in Brazil, he became interested in the abundant psychic phenomena, psychic surgeons, poltergeist mediums, etc., Guy then returned to England in 1975 and has written a total of 12 books, the best known being This House is Haunted, The True Story of the Enfield Poltergeist, and most recently, Twin Telepathy. And uh, we're going to talk with uh, Mr. Playfair about the Enfield Poltergeist. Thank you very much for uh, being here with us this late this evening, sir. I appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. The Enfield Poltergeist case, uh, you... you really seem to, according to the bio, find an interest in psychic phenomena while you were in Brazil. Had you had any what you would consider to be supernatural or psychic phenomena occur in your life prior to that moment in Brazil? No, not really, except that my um, mother was very interested, and she had some um, ability to to, um, dream things that were going to happen. Uh, nothing terribly dramatic. I mean, no, no disasters, sort of trivial incidents. But she, she was a member of the Society for Psychical Research, of which I'm, I'm also a member, and indeed a vice president, nonetheless. And um, I grew up uh, just regarding this sort of thing as perfectly normal. And I used to read the journal of the Society for Psychical Research, along with my jazz magazine and comic, and, and um, it, it was just um, part of everyday life. It, I, it never never struck me as paranormal or weird or strange or anything. It was just it was uh, perfectly natural. Can you explain to us, especially our listeners across the United States and around the world that may not be familiar with it, but tell me a little bit about the Society for Psychical Research. How long has that been around? Well, it was founded in 1882. So it's been around for 130-something years, and it's still going strong, I'm glad to say, although the American counterpart has appears to have vanished without trace lately. And um, the SPR in Britain was founded by a very distinguished bunch of um, academics and uh, future politicians, including no less than the Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, and um, all sorts of eminent Victorians, such as um, Tennyson, Ruskin, and all that sort of crowd. And um, for a time, it was um, very, very popular and, and quite a quite a solid um, part of, of the general culture in Britain, I think partly due to a reaction against the um, shocking discoveries of Mr. Darwin and his colleague, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was, of course, a spiritualist as well. So it was all a bit confusing, but for, um, the, the SPR kept going. It's never closed, and it's still going, and it's um, doing very well and attracting a lot of, incidentally, a great many American members since their own, their own society seems to have um, vanished down the plug hole, and, and we, we are welcoming um, the, the survivors. Now, so, uh, with the Society yeah. for Cyclical Research, what was the initial intent? Was it simply to have a place for people to come and discuss and explore this phenomena? Was it to put these claims to the test? It was very simple, actually. It was um, it stated in the first issue of the journal. I can't remember it by heart, but it, what it amounted to was they are <clears throat> founded to examine the faculties of of humans, known or imagined, which cannot be explained in terms of any conventional science. And that, that's still the position. I mean, we look into things that can't be explained, and we, we do explain some of them as fake and fraud and delusion and deception and so on. But there are quite a few that we can't explain, and they remain what some people like to call paranormal, which is um, a word I don't like very much, but it... it, it um, if people know what it what it's taken to mean, it simply means that we're, that things do happen that we can't explain, and we um, many people just prefer to ignore them or assume that they must be um, fraud or mistakes. 
but we t- we tend to take a rather closer look at them and um, decide that some of them are not uh, fraud or deception and deserve further study, and that's what we do. When you come upon a case that that you are able to um, ascertain is not a fraud or a, an, an outright deception, you know, looking at those type of cases, do you believe that this then does point to proof of the afterlife? Does it prove to the point that we as humans do have the ability uh, to move things with our mind, to move things with our will, to influence the surroundings around us outside of our physical form? Well, we, we tend to avoid the word proof because uh, nowadays that's rather frowned upon unless you're talking about mathematical equations which you can prove, but you can't really prove anything else. I mean, I can't prove that the sun is going to appear tomorrow morning, but it probably will. Um, what, what, we, um, what, what we prefer to... Um, Oh, sorry, I got lost. What was the question again? Well, just when you're looking at cases that are not deception or fraud, mm-hmm. or at least not blatantly, I mean, it could be mistaken, uh, it, and you look at this, does your society look at the fact that, yes, we believe the afterlife does exist, that, that once we leave our physical form, there are things like ghosts, and that our physical abilities transcend our body, we can move things with our mind, we can uh, do things. Is that more the findings, or do you do you think that there's much more scientific explanation for that phenomena? Well, well we can, expl- we, we can um, testify to some things, but not others. I mean, I can speak for what I've seen. I, I have seen an object appearing in midair as if materializing out of nowhere, and I will testify to that in court. I'm absolutely certain brilliantly lit room but by daylight, sunshine, and this small, um, it was actually a small shaving mirror just appeared in, in right in front of my nose and, and with nobody within reach, and I'm as certain of that as I'm, I am of anything. Now this, I've also seen... Um, can I ask one thing about that, Mr. Playfair? The mirror that appeared in front of you out of thin air, had it come from another room, from another location that you were familiar with, and was it a mirror that people recognized, or was it yes. new? Yes, yes, we, we easily found where it came from. It came from the bathroom, the other side of a solid concrete wall with no open doors, and it was covered with soap bubbles. So it was um, sort of yanked out of the basin, as it were, and taken apparently through two, two concrete walls, through the bathroom and the, and the corridor. That, that, was, um, that was not actually on the Enfield case. That was an, another one that I, I followed up with. And, but um, since I was there and I saw it, and I, I actually tape-recorded uh, my commentary on it, so I'm sure I'm not, I didn't imagine it. And... Um, and is there, when, when you have an experience like that, Mr. Playfair, and you, you can't, you know, there, there's no understandable, reasonable explanation for something like that to occur, no. how do we file that? I mean, where, where does that go under? Is, that, uh, is, it, is it apportation? Is it ghostly? Is it just an energetic shift? How do we start to begin to categorize those kind of, you know, events? Well, I don't worry too much if it can be explained or not, because all kinds of things in the past couldn't be explained. I mean, right. like meteorites and continental drift and quite a few other things. Certainly. And they're now known to be absolutely true and real. And, and um, all, all the people who objected to them in the um, 19th century or earlier are quite simply wrong. And I think the same is going to be seen to apply to a number of things today which are considered to be totally impossible. Um, it, do, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I just trust my own senses, and I, I'm fairly experienced as a, as a journalist and reporter, and if I, if I see something happen, I, I think I know what happened. And um, if it's a um, shaving mirror appearing out of nowhere and um, various other things, which, which are not quite so dramatic but equally certain, I just stick them in the back of my mind and file them as um, experiences and just hope they'll get an explanation one day. There, there, are, there are sort of beginnings of explanations in terms of uh, modern 21st century physics, which I'm 
not quite re- the right person to comment on, but I've I've heard some suggestions which are even more wacky than the sort of things that I come up with. I mean, <laughs> physics, physics is getting very strange these days. Mr. Playfair, we were talking about some of the different aspects of um, the paranormal, which I know that's a, a loose word in your canon, uh, but it, it, as you said, it, it explains to people the the idea of what we're looking at in these type of cases. When you're seeing things that are apporting, and, and as you said, you know as a journalist and as a reporter that what you see is what you see. And as Harry Houdini has told us, a lot of times what we see is not what we see. It's how the brain perceives things to occur. And how do you discern as, a, as an investigative reporter and as um, certainly somebody involved in the, uh, in the field for as many years as you've had, how do you discern something as a blatant deception as opposed to uh, true, ev- or not evidence, but true experiences that, uh, that don't seem to be influenced by anyone with a nefarious intention? Well, I've had plenty of experience with magicians, including some very good um, senior members of the British Magic Circle, and I certainly don't trust uh, trust my uh, eyes when I'm in their company. But you're talking about really hardened professionals there, which most people are not. And if they were, they'd all be on the stage and making a fortune, as um, some of our top magicians are, in this country are, are doing. So, so that's really quite simple, and also. Um, when you, when you get these magicians off stage, they will very often admit that there are all kinds of things that happen which they cannot explain. I, I, I took a senior member of the magic circle out to meet Uri Geller a few years ago, and he was just totally <laughs> flummoxed. He, he could not account. He issued a public challenge on the radio for anybody to repeat what he had witnessed Uri doing. So I thought that was rather generous of him. And um, that's material for another program. I could tell you a great deal about Uri Geller, but maybe not now. Very well. Yeah, we'd love to uh, visit with you again. I mean, you certainly have uh, had a a long history in this type of research. Uh, Before we do launch into the Enfield Poltergeist case, which we'll spend the rest of uh, the the show discussing with you uh, in your time with us, in the cases that you have investigated, aside from things apporting and, and seeing something physically manifest in front of you and, and drop, have you seen what people refer to as the Holy Grail? Have you seen what you believe to be a spirit manifestation or a uh, some kind of energetic form taking human f- form? Uh, no, sorry. I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid I haven't. But, um I know people who have, but um, that's not quite the same thing. <laughs> right. um, I, I haven't been lucky yet, but I'm um, be quite happy to to meet one if there's one around. Does does the uh, society still research claims on an active basis of uh, poltergeist, ghostly activity, and do they stretch out into things like UFO or cryptid research? Um. We're still very active. We have what's known as a Spontaneous Phenomena Committee, which I belong to, and we get reports from members of the public, um, not quite every day, but certainly every week. And um, we do check up as many as we can, and, and um, they, they range from um, you know complete uh, wacko nonsense to, to very, very interesting material, which sometimes... Um, we managed to persuade the victims to write them up properly, even to the extent of a full-length book. We've had two cases recently which ended up in um, in books which were both very well written and have done very well, and um, th- that is our sort of ideal solution. But um, some of them certainly are completely crazy, and um, UFOs we tend to not follow up because so many other people do, and it, it's... Um, kind of duplication of efforts, and we, we prefer to do um, the kind of research that nobody else does, um, at least as thoroughly as, as, as we do. When you came back from Brazil after researching uh, all of this strange phenomenon and, and claims of psychic surgery and, and poltergeist manifestations, how did your attention um, get to the Enfield poltergeist case? Was that something that was brought to you? Had you heard about it through news reports or other reports? Can you explain that to no, us? No, that was quite 
strange, actually, because um, it was just a series of coincidences which which, which began with a lecture in uh, August of 1977. Um, the, the Society of Psychical Research has a regular monthly lecture, which happened to be on poltergeist. So I, I went along and listened and thought it was very good. And um, there was a fellow sitting behind me, who I didn't really know very well, called Maurice Gross, who popped up at question time and said that he was investigating a case right now and he would like some help. And um, I didn't rush to volunteer because I'd just finished writing an extremely long and exhausting book and I wanted to go on holiday. I was, in fact, just about to uh, go, go along and buy, buy a ticket the following day. And then I heard him on the radio together with a BBC reporter who had spent the night in the house in Enfield. And I remembered the words of my Brazilian um, um, colleague, Hernani Andrade, whose institute I, I, I worked with for three years. He said, when a spontaneous phenomenon turns up, it's not going to wait for you, so go after it. So I thought, right, this is it, and I, I went after it, and um, the first night I spent in the house, I, I saw quite enough to persuade me to come back, and I stayed for 14 months. So, there you are. When you hear claims like the ones that were being made surrounding the Enfield Poltergeist case, and, and understanding that it is part of what you're doing in your research, are there sometimes when you hear the claims that you think this is just too fantastic, this sounds like fantasy, I'm not even going to bother wasting time going into to look at something like this, or do you take every case as though what they're saying is true and then go in there to disprove it? Um, no, I, I cover it very much as I would any kind of story. If it was a plane crash or, or somebody resigning from the government or whatever. I just go along and see what is happening and uh, who, who says that they've witnessed um, what and what I witnessed myself. And then I follow it up with, with the relevant questions. I just treat it like anything else, really. Uh, in the case of Enfield, I was lucky. And on my first night, there was a very minor incident, which I was totally satisfied could not have been um, explained normally. It was simply a tiny marble falling onto the floor in front of my feet and um, staying absolutely motionless as it landed, which you cannot fake. You cannot do that. You just try. Try dropping a marble anywhere you like, and it's going to roll. It's going to bounce. It may shoot across the room. It's not going to stay put at the exact point where it hits the floor. It just will not do that. Well, it did do that to me, and a good enough light for me to see it, and it did it several times um, later. And it's a well-known feature of poltergeist. It's as if somebody had picked up the marble and put it down by hand, except that there weren't any hands around. So it's, it's little things like that which build up your certainty that you are dealing with something which is not quite normal. Can you and give that's me just the first of hundreds of incidents which I could list if we had all night? Could you give me a, a, a definition from um, your point of view, from the society's point of view, uh, of what? And, and the society I'm referring to is the Society of Psychical Research in the UK. What is the definition of poltergeist? Um. I don't think we got one, actually. We, the, <laughs> the SPR doesn't have any corporate opinions. We, we, are, um, we, we only have one collective opinion, which is our obligation to, to investigate unexplained um, phenomena. That's it. We, we have uh, a very wide range of, of um, attitudes. We have what you might call total believers, spiritualists, and so on. And then we have total skeptics. We've got quite a few of them, and we've got people who um, don't believe in anything, but they, they <clears throat> join the society in case anything happens to make them change their minds, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> well, the reason so, I ask, uh, a lot of... any any um, any sort of official opinions on anything. Well, a lot of the world's 
idea of poltergeist comes from the Hollywood versions of the movies. It's active ghosts. It's it's angry ghosts. There also seems to be a much larger faction that believes it's more psychokinetic energy and um, mm. and things. Where where do you kind of come in, or do you believe it's a mixture of both? Well, of course, the, the, the very word poltergeist means uh, noisy spirits, and it was um, said to have been coined by Martin Luther, but in fact, I've been assured by German scholar colleagues that it was in use long before Luther used it in the early 16th century. In fact, we're coming up to the 500th anniversary of the first appearance of the word in print, which is interesting. You'd think we would have made a bit more progress by now. But yeah. <laughs> and um, Luther, of course, thought it was perfectly straightforward. It was an evil spirit, and that was that. And if you were a, um, a Lutheran reformer in, in the 16th century, that was a perfectly uh, natural belief to have. But we um, time has moved on, and we don't really think in the same way these days. And um, Luther's various uh, fantasies about, about what he called um, poltergeist, and he also used the rather delightful word rump, rumpelgeist, which we could translate as rumble ghost, which unfortunately we didn't choose. But um, we still don't have a word in English for poltergeist, which is curious. And uh, we haven't the faintest idea what it is, and it may it may not be um, uh, an object at all. I mean, it's like what Bertrand Russell said about electricity. It's not it's not a thing like St Paul's Cathedral, but it's the way in which things behave. And he said that all we can do is to describe how it behaves, and that that's all we can we can do. And it's the same with with poltergeists. We can tell you what they do. But we certainly can't tell you what they are, and we don't know what the original source of the apparent intelligence might be. Mr. Playfair, talking about the the idea of poltergeist, and as you said, you so eloquently uh, spoke about it a few seconds ago, uh, a few minutes ago, talking about um, maybe that it is not a thing so much as a concept, and what is that concept? What do these, what does that entail? What do you find are the most common traits when it comes to a poltergeist style? activity or haunting, as people will call it? Well, in fact, the very first um, public talk that I ever gave was based on my my experiences in Brazil, where we made a kind of a chart of a list of things that poltergeists do, you know, like um, throw small objects around and throwing large objects around and puddles of water on the floor and occasional outbreaks of fire, and a total of about 15 different symptoms, if you like, and um, we came to the conclusion that the poltergeist is really a syndrome, meaning a concurrence of symptoms, and um, there are about 15 or even more things that they can do. They don't always do them all at once, thank heavens, but um, they, always, they always tend to be the same on all cases. I mean, you you, you tend to start with knocking um knocking on the walls and the floors and sometimes the ceiling as well. And um, then you get small objects thrown around and then you get larger objects. And then you get these curious puddles of water on the floor, which have very sharp outlines, as if you dropped an ice cube and it melted with a with a hard outline. You know, it's, it's no splashing at all. And then you get the more dramatic stuff where, where sometimes you get people actually... Um, levitated, or even, as in Enfield case, apparently um, bilocated in the sense of the wall. Maybe we can come to that later. And um, there is a curious consistency from one case to another. Very often you get absolutely identical incidents happening, for example, in Brazil and New Zealand, I mean, or South Africa, or Siberia, or wherever. I mean, it's a universal phenomenon. We we get reports in the SPR frequently. We've got about two hundred on file, just in, from the last couple of years. And we've got we've got a proper um, computerized archive being built up at the moment. And since we started it in um, 2011, I think it was, we've now got more than two hundred cases. So they 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 keep on coming. 
And you said that they'll start with knockings, then uh, uh, moisture, apportation items, uh, things being moved about, thrown about. Is there any kind of consistency to the time frame that a poltergeist set of activities will occur? Is it uh, can it go weeks, months, days, or is there usually you know a rule of thumb that it, it only goes about two weeks, something along those lines? Uh, no, unfortunately, there isn't. I mean. Um they can be very short. There was one one uh, case I remember very well from Brazil, which lasted only one day, an uh, extremely active day, but it, it, it stopped after that. And the Enfield case went on for 14 months. And um, another of the Brazilian ones lasted for, I think, about three years in four different houses. So there is there is a very wide range of time involved. And does it seem to, uh, as it goes, will it it slowly build to a crescendo and then just stop? Or does it seem to, like a bell curve, will it begin at a low pace, then get to a large one and then taper off again slowly? Um, Well, I can only speak for the cases that I'm familiar with. They tend to start fairly active and gradually fade out, um, as happened to Enfield, which is... Really, a tremendous anticlimax. It just just sort of stopped for no reason at all that we, that we could that we could detect. Um, no, they, they don't. They don't have the kind of glorious climax that you get on the films. Um, they they tend to be um, more active um, at the start, and sometimes with a kind of um, climax in the middle. Um, in the case of Enfield, I think the most um, the most active day was about a month after, after the thing had started, but then it just tailed off, and the, um, the children started fooling around, playing a few tricks and things, which was perfectly okay. I mean, it was, it's, that's what they wanted to do, and um, it, then it just sort of, as if it had lost interest and gave up and went away. Now, are there any commonalities in the people? that you've investigated that have these claims of, of paranormal or, or poltergeist activity. Um, you know, it's been thought of here in the United States, I know through some of the researchers, that uh, uh, what they refer to as a poltergeist agent, it usually seems to center around one specific family member. And in in some cases, those family members uh, deal with a, some level of epilepsy. Is there any truth or fact behind that theory to your research? Uh, yes, there is. Um, it's certainly worth uh, looking into. Um, there was a very distant connection with epilepsy in in the Enfield case. Um, the girl's mother uh, had a history of it as, as, as a younger woman, although there was no sign of it when we knew her, and it was certainly not um, not serious. And as far as I know, none of none of the children had any um, trace of epilepsy, but it was. Um, there was, a, there was a history, as you might say. But then, of course, um, there are an awful lot of epileptics who don't have any, any poltergeist phenomena. So exactly. Every time you come out with a theory in this business, there's something comes along which, which just denies it. It's, it's very hard to be, be sure about any um, conditions that guarantee it, as it were. So there, you haven't found any kind of soft parameters to what normally proceeds or... or is incorporated in the people involved in the poltergeist case, uh, uh, economic status, uh, uh, a religious yeah, well, backgrounds, yeah, anything like that? A, up to a point. I mean, the, you, you don't get, um, you, know, um, you know, as Tolstoy might have put it, uh, all unhappy families are unhappy for different reasons. And um, you don't tend to get poltergeist in well-adjusted, happy families. There is always tension around and um, they are fairly common when there's a young girl experiencing her first period. Um, that certainly hap- happened at Enfield. Uh, that we managed to, uh, to um, identify the actual day. And uh, it was an incredibly active day when absolutely everything was happening all at once. Um, what, what do you believe they, in? What is the, what does the society believe has to do with the the flowering of a woman at that time in her life? What about that seems to kick off this this chaotic energy? Well, as I said, this society doesn't have any collective opinions, but that, um, the, 
it is a very common observation that um, when uh, the time of the menarche, the first period, comes along, um, it's a very traumatic experience for, for a girl. I mean, you you have to be a woman to explain this properly, but from, from what I've observed, um, it, it, it is a great um, change in the um, way of life. And um, it does involve uh, a dramatic shift in the way that the child's energies um, move around. And it does appear to be associated with um, a great, quite a few poltergeist cases. No, not all of them by any means, but um, quite a few. But then, then you have to think. But um, you think of how many teenage girls there are in the United Kingdom. Um, there must be millions of them, and yet very few uh, experience any kind of poltergeist. Why that? Why they are so rare is one of the biggest mysteries. Because they they tend to affect. Um, there seems to be some kind of class war going on here because the poltergeists invariably go for, go for the people on the bottom end of the social scale. You know, the um, poorest uh, families quite often living on welfare. They don't go for the well well to do upper classes, or if they do, we don't get to hear about them. Right, they might be hiding that out of embarrassment or or shame. Have we found any correlation, Mister Playfair, with the locations themselves. Is there any kind of energetic signature? Are they rich in, you know, limestone, granite, quartz, uh, underground? Is there water flowing under? Uh, are they under power lines? Is there anything like that that we can correlate to this type of activity physically? Not that I know of, no. I, th- I, um, I think if, if there were, there would be far more of them because whatever conditions might pertain in any given poltergeist case would not be unique. You know, we've got power cables all over the country, and we've got underground water practically everywhere, and yet we don't have products everywhere, thank goodness. So I, I don't go for that sort of approach at all, I'm afraid. I, um, no, no, no evidence to support it. Okay. And uh, how about times of year? Is there anything that we can correlate to weather patterns, uh, seasonal disorders, anything along those lines? Don't think so, No. Uh, uh, the Enfield run began in the end of August, in a fairly hot summer, and of course Brazil was hot all the time. Right. Um, but there's also been reported from cold countries, um, quite a few from Russia, and um, no, I, I don't think the weather affects it at all. With cases of poltergeist activity, when you have these kind of random bursts of energy, things moving without being touched, uh, doors opening and slamming, knocking, banging sounds, moisture that appears on the floor or or mm-hmm. dripping from the ceiling where there is no source for it to be there. Um, are there accounts where voices are heard, uh, apparitions or, uh, you know, um, seemingly ghosts seem to be involved in, in the poltergeist cases you've investigated? Or is that a, a different type of experience altogether? Um, no, not not visible ghosts in my experience, but we did have voices. Um, I managed to tape record a voice, what sounded very much like a voice at, at Enfield, which was certainly not anybody present. And um, I, 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 um, I distinctly had the, the impression of, a, of a, an extra intelligence involved. It's rather hard to describe, but I, I, I think of poltergeist as an entity in the sense of something that exists in its own right, and it's not part of something else. And there appear to be a, a certain degree of independence. In other words, they do exactly what they like, but they, they do depend on a, a focus or an epicenter person to, to get the energy they need, because they, they can't operate in a completely empty environment. They don't operate in empty houses, as, as far as I know. Is there a sort of frustrated, mixed-up teenager to right. provide the fuel? Is there any kind of scientific data that can uh, back up? Uh, you know, is there is there something energetic that we can um, measure when they appear, when their activity takes place? Do we see spikes in electromagnetic fields? Do we see um, uh, drain in regular power fields or in physical attributes on the people involved in the case? 
Well, we have tried to record um, whatever we can instrumentally, and we've had a certain amount of success, actually. We, um, many years ago, in fact, 30 years ago now in Brazil, I was on a case where they had unusually loud knocking, really deafening crashes on the um, floor above, and I managed to tape record quite a lot of these noises with, with my colleague, um, Suzuku, who was with me, and we both recorded them on different recorders. And then um, it occurred to me at the time to go and do a bit of knocking ourselves and then record that and see if there was any difference on a spectrometer, you know, see if the acoustic signature, as they right. call it, looked different. Well, unfortunately, we couldn't find anybody in Sao Paulo, Brazil, who had the necessary time or equipment to do that, so we just dropped it. And then um, it wasn't until 2010 that a colleague of mine from the SPR, Barry Colvin, who's got his own laboratory and he's got all the gear necessary, he he decided to do it properly. And we rounded up, um, we managed to get tape recordings from about 14 different cases um, from four different countries. And... Um, he ran them all through his machine and found found exactly the same effect on all of them. They were not normal at all, because if you, you make any kind of percussive sound, uh, tapping your hands or banging the floor or hitting a nail with a hammer or whatever, you get a very uh, sharp peak right at the beginning, and then it, it, it slowly drops off to, down to, to zero. Well, poltergeist is quite different. It looks more like an earthquake. It starts off sort of low, and then it builds up to a peak in the middle, and then drops off. And, and you cannot fake that. We, we issued, in fact, a challenge five years ago for anybody to fake it, and um, one or two clever magicians said they could, but they never got around to doing it. <laughs> and um, if I had the money, I'd offer a reward because um, it's, you, you can't. You, I maintain that you just can't do it. It's fascinating that you say that as, as we've spoken to people that are proficient in getting electronic voice phenomena. And in a lot of cases, oh, yeah. in a lot of cases, they'll say that they will get a pop or, or a, a, some kind of like ping or pop or knock noise before they'll get their really good EVP. And it almost makes you wonder, is this like a sonic boom? Is it something coming through an energy field? To, before things are released, before that energy is, is expended? Um, I have heard that sort of um, tricks and pops and things on tape recordings, yes. Um, there may be a connection, but we never, we never get any um, voices of the EVP type. That, that's really a whole different area, which I haven't had very much luck with. I, I listened to... Um, a lot of strange noises on the right. tape, and um, I may be rather biased by, by the two years of military service that I did as a, as a um, uh, um, direction finder in the Royal Air Force, where you have to train to listen to a pilot's uh, signals, which can be very cryptic and brief, and they, they sound rather like EVP. <laughs> And you get all sorts of um, normal noises on, on the air, which you have to learn the difference. So I got a bit slightly skeptical about the whole subject, and I, I heard some very uh, dubious so-called voices. So I'm not totally excited about them yet, I'm afraid. Well, that, and that's fine. I just, like I said, I think it's fascinating that in some of the poltergeist cases, it begins with the banging and pounding noises. Uh, yeah. And then activity takes place, just like in some of these cases of electronic voice phenomena that are recorded where you can hear this or a pop or, or some kind of interactive noise as though it's pushing through to be heard. It's, it's, it's coming almost seemingly from another location. We, we only have about two minutes left in this hour, uh, and, and next hour I promise we're going to spend completely on the Enfield case, but I've, it's been fascinating to speak with you about this. Have you ever researched a case where you have felt physically in danger because of what's going on? Uh, no. You, you, you tend to get used to these things. Um... I've never heard of anybody in uh, a poltergeist case be being um, seriously hurt. Now and then you get in the way of a 
flying book or something, but uh, uh, one of the photographers at Enfield had a rather nasty bang on the head from a, from a piece of uh, Lego brick, which could have got him in the eye, but it luckily didn't. Um, on the whole, they don't hurt people, though. That's, that's small mercy. It, it, I know in cases there's photographs uh, from the Enfield case where the girls seem to be thrown from one bed to another, or you see these photographs of them in the air. Uh, we'll talk mm. about that and more. We've got so much more to cover on the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. We hope you enjoyed part one of our tribute to Guy Lyon Playfair with The Anatomy of a Poltergeist. Remember to join us again Wednesday for the remainder of that original interview in its entirety as we investigate the Enfield Poltergeist here on the best in paranormal talk radio, Beyond the Darkness.